So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, whether on site or online, for this uh, very interesting session regarding mitral, clip tre mitral treatment, mitral regurgitation treatment, and more specifically with uh, the clip device. Um, uh, I'm here today with uh, Professor Fred Spratz from Switzerland, and from Germany we have uh, Professor Rottenbauer and Professor Baldus. Uh, so please, uh, we also have on the as a chat master Martin Swans, who's going to be able to answer all your questions by the chat through the chat if you want. But people who are online, who are here, you can also ask us your questions. We are here to discuss together. And the point of this session is to learn what did the new guidelines bring to us. How can we apply those uh, guidelines in our daily practice? and also learn more about the real-life data from the CLIP device recently. So without any delay, we will move to the first case presentation with uh, Professor Baldus. Yeah, Nicole, thanks so much for your kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to present to you uh, the upcoming patient. So this is a patient we actually saw uh, more than a year ago in in our outpatient clinic, a 77-year-old male at that time, which was presented to us with the progressive signs of heart failure at uh, exertional dyspnea. It's a patient who was known for coronary artery disease. He received a stent, which did not explain uh, the symptoms he presented. A patient with long persisting atrial fibrillation and renal insufficiency. So this patient was seen um, by our staff and we did an echo and this is uh, the echo one year ago. What you can see is quite preserved left ventricular function, quite a substantial enlargement of the left atria. But perhaps what is even more impressive is the texture of the ventricle of the myocardium itself. So if um, you do the analysis here, indeed it turned out to be um, an amyloidosis pattern. You can see nicely the apical sparing. Um, and you also see that this patient has mitral regurgitation. But this, at that time, was not so impressive, an ERO area of 0.2. And the patient was, uh, in absence of any heart failure medication nor a uh, specific medication for his um, amyloidosis, it turned out to be by biopsy that this patient had ATTR amyloidosis a wild type uh, form, and he was uh, therefore set on uh, Tafamidis and was uh, treated um, and followed up um, thereafter. So what happened this year, actually um, in April, March and April, was that the patient was hospitalized and he came to our hospital in bad condition. He had a pulmonary congestion um, with a history of continuous decline of his uh, exercise capability. He was then in permanent atrial fibrillation was tried to be cardioverted to sinus rhythm before and uh, presented this SDS score. So um, this is basically the introduction. We were asked how to treat this patient on optimal medical therapy with um, um, uh, impressive mitral regurgitation, which we will talk about later more precisely. And um, that's basically the, the teaser for, for right now. Very spectacular case. I mean, it really did, uh, the mitral regurgitation did increase very quickly, let's say. Uh, so bef before we really discuss uh, this case, I would like to turn to you, Fabien. You participated in the writing of the guidelines of mitral regurgitation. And uh, this year it was kind of rich because we had also the guidelines of heart failure. So can you tell us more about what, did, what changed in the treatment of secondary mitral regurgitation? Sure, Nicole. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that question. So if we look at uh, 2021 guidelines um, regarding the specific topic of secondary mitral regurgitation, then we, we have a new 2A indication for the patient uh, fulfilling the co-op criteria. So you can see here transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair as an indicated therapy in selected patient. That means in the patient with uh, fulfilling this criteria, we'll come back on this um, in, in, in one minute. Uh, and they have a 2A recommendation. But, and that's an important point of, as well, the, the guideline, and that's also important for the future of the treatment of the patient, the guideline uh, keep a 2B recommendation as well for patient not fulfilling the co-op criteria, and that's typically 
patient that can benefit from a symptomatic point of view of transcatheter edge to edge repair on one side, but also, as you can see, and for the first time, uh, the guideline also foresee a, re uh, a recommendation to be also for other transcatheter option, and that include, of course, also replacement therapy uh, with a tendine valve, for example, that is now uh, available in Europe. So I think two level of recommendation that really have the, the aim to, to, um, to treat all the population of patients we see in, in secondary mitral regurgitation. So if we look quickly at these criteria, so we are talking about the, the criteria inclusion and exclusion criteria of the co-opt randomized trial, which was a trial comparing medical treatment to mitral clip uh, in patients with uh, secondary MR. You can see that the patient included were, um, were had an LVEF of between 20 and 50 percent. They had severe secondary MR and were symptomatic, and they had a left end systolic diameter of less than 70 uh, millimeter. And on the other side, exclusion criteria include a uh, sign of advanced heart failure, in particular on the right side of the heart, with uh, fixed uh, severe pulmonary hypertension, but also severe right ventricular dysfunction and severe tricuspid regurgitation. Are these criteria useful? Uh, the answer is yes. We saw this in derivation study. You can see that all the, 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 the application of the co-op criteria retrospectively on a big um, in a large cohort of patients with secondary MR, the Euro SMR, allow to distinguish between two uh, categories of patients with different prognosis after transcatheter edge to edge repair. But the second very important observation in that study as well was that this patient that did not fulfill the criteria in the study had also a symptomatic benefit from, from the therapy, as you can see here with a six minute walking distance. So the future now, the future are new indications for secondary mitral regurgitation, atrial mitral regurgitation. We don't know so much about this. That's a future gap in the evidence we need to, uh, where we need to do additional research. We have some research on that, but um, uh, certainly need, need more. Uh, what is the best option in that uh, category of patient? And the other one are the most advanced patients, and we have preliminary data from the mitral beach registry showing that we are able with mitral clip to improve symptoms, but also to delist some of the patients uh, due to uh, clinical improvement. So very interesting. After all the debate between co-opt and mitral FR, at the end of the day, both patient type of patients made it to the guidelines, but with different level of evidence and with exactly. different uh, yeah. And we really need to consider the symptoms, I guess, to distinguish if we will do those two B patients. Uh, so how about asymptomatic patients? So there is also a very important part of the guideline. Uh, in the direction of the treatment of asymptomatic patients with primary mitral regurgitation. And this is based on the data of the MIDA registry. So basically, the indication, as you can see here, was extended. And that's also you know, a future area of, of treatment, asymptomatic patients with primary mitral regurgitation. So it was, it was extended to patients with a left ventricular end systolic diameter of more or equal to 40. And also to, with atrial dilatation, as you can see, defined not only as a volume of more than 60, but also a diameter more than 55. So it should be technical, but you know the whole spirit of the of the guideline is here to extend in many situations that would be surgery in primary MR. But there is a, for the future uh, there is an area of research in asymptomatic patients where maybe also transcatheter option could be a good option. Interesting. And uh, one last question, a question regarding the difference between the European and American guidelines, and especially for patients with primary MR. What, how can you explain this difference? So there is a difference in the level of evidence of the, 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 the indication for transcatheter edge to edge repair between the European and the American guideline. You can see that we have a 2B recommendation and there is a 2A recommendation in the American guidelines. And the reason was that since uh, Everest, there was no new randomized data um, regarding and uh, con concerning this particular population of patients. And that was the feeling of the task force that the, the new evidence was not enough to upgrade this recommendation. But if you look also at the American guidelines and the two-way recommendation, this recommendation has also some restrictions we don't have in Europe concerning patients uh, who are really or severely symptomatic, uh, as it is described, uh, with an NYHA class 3 and 4. And you know, finally, I think the population of patients that uh, is treated and, and that is concerned by these two recommendations is, is quite similar. 
Okay, thank you, Fabien. Thank uh, you. Please don't hesitate on asking any questions you want. Feel free even to interrupt just so we can discuss together. So I will turn maybe to uh, you, Professor Baldus, before the presenting the, the next part of your case. Is uh, this what you are actually doing in your daily practice? Did the guidelines really change something or you were already there? Well, um, I think we all convinced about uh, the, um, the value of transcatheter reconstruction of mitral valves. Um, um, and, and I think uh, we, in Germany, we, we obviously did quite a lot of uh, procedures and in a way um, were pacemakers here. But um, I think the guidelines are very important because they um, uh, show us how you should direct the way of talking to a patient. Do you talk to a patient in a way that you say you improve the prognosis of the patient, or can you talk to him and saying, well, you, you probably do not get a better prognosis by treatment, but we have a high likelihood that you will feel better and that quality of life will improve. So, so I think in this um, uh, concern, it's an, it's an important asset we have with the new guidelines. Thank you. Uh, very realistic. How about you? Did, did, was there a before and after those guidelines, or...? Was it a smooth transition? Yeah, I think what is made clear now in the guidelines is that we have two uh, different diseases, primary and secondary. We knew that before, but uh, every patient got into one trial, the Everest 2 trial, for instance. And, and now it's clear that the comparator um, for surgery um, it, it, or, or the comparator for the clip th therapy, let it put that way, is not surgery for functional MR. I think this is something um, that made the guidelines now very clear that um, the, the, the second best option is surgery in these cases. Whereas in degenerative disease, I think we should be more conservative with edge-to-edge -edge repair and, and the guidelines. And, and we, we just heard that, highlight that, and they gave it so far a to be indication it might get better with better uh, study results, but we have to wait for a repair MI or, or other studies um, to address that. So it changed our practice for sure. We will have new randomized data coming very soon. You mentioned one of the, of the studies. There is also a French study. So there will be more data on, 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 on primary MR as well. And I think the second point is also extremely important. So we have to, the comparator is actually medical treatment. I think that's what is performing also well in secondary mitral agitation. And, um, and that would be also the future comparator for, 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 future, uh, for future studies. But did you, the, I mean, Stefan, did you, did you change your practice also regarding um, medical treatment? Um, after the mitral FR co uh, discussion? I mean, for sure we changed medical treatment. I mean, we have, we have a, a, a new armamentarium of, of treatment options and a new way how you should uh, introduce uh, and, 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 and the, 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 how quick you should introduce medical therapy in a patient with functional MR and the depressed LV function. So, so I would say yes. I mean, we know that for Zacopitril valsartan, we know that for uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, you can decrease uh, the extent of mitral regurgitation. So this is obviously something which has to go first. And this is clearly depicted in the guidelines. Okay. Thank you. So let's uh, go back to your case. Okay. If you can show hey, us. Maybe, that. Stefan, while you present the case, there is a question coming in online. Um, it, it asks, um, was the patient hypovolemic when you saw it in, in, in the hospital? He initially, yes, extremely important. He initially was, and you should make your judgment on severity of mitral regurgitation, as well as for, in particular, tricuspid regurgitation in a patient who is well-balanced, fluid-balanced. So, so initially, yes, he was. So the question now is what to do with this patient. Uh, should, we, should we operate on? on? I mean, he's in... Uh, a, a patient below 80 years, his LV function was not too bad, uh, definitely above 30 percent. He has renal insufficiency, um, should, and he has this amyloidosis. Should we should we operate on him? Um, I think this is. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, Fabian, would you like to comment? You mean surgery? Yeah, surgery versus versus edge-to-edge uh, uh, -edge repair. So, you know, I, I think you have a 77-year-old patient with a diagnosis of amyloidosis. Uh, 
cardiac decompensation. You call it preserve left ventricular function, but I think it was not completely normal. No, no, it was it was 35 percent. 35 percent. So I think uh, for me, uh, it's not a surgical candidate. So I will not go for surgery yeah, in that right. situation because we we don't have so much evidence on the, that surgery is helpful in in patients with secondary mitral regurgitation. So of course the the hypervolemic issue is a, is an important one. So I, I think we know you should probably relook at mitral regurgitation after. Um, implementation of medical treatment. But if this is still severe and the patient symptomatic, then he needs, he needs a therapy. And, and this therapy, you know, surgery is driven by revascularization. So I think um, in, in that situation, um, that's probably not the first line therapy. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we what we decided. It's, uh, it's uh, isolated mitral valve uh, disease in this case. So we went for uh, a reconstructive therapy and for a CLIP procedure. And what I want to show you now is um, basically the uh, introductory echo, which was performed by a young resident of us who's uh, doing the procedure with us. Um, we have a track for, uh, for um, interventional images, which, which we try to increase uh, in, in the national society. And, and uh, so you will see her uh, together with a, an attending who is uh, taking care of questions thereafter. So this is basically here the so as we can see here, we have the, a severe hypertrophy of the left ventricle um, due to the amyloidosis of the patient. And we can see here the severe mitral regurgitation due to enlargement of the left atrium with a little thickened um, leaflets with tethering and tenting. And we have an error of, of no, uh, 0 0.36 and uh, regurgitation volume of, I can show you, uh, 46 milliliters. And the vena contracta was B plane 10 millimeters. The mitral valve area is measured with 5.5 uh, um, square centimeters. And the 3D vena contracta was 1.3 square centimeters. So this is a 3D of the mitral valve where you can see the enlargement of the left atrium and the central regurgitation. Please acknowledge this little indentation between P2 and P3, um, which was nicely uh, observed here. And yeah, and this, these are the, uh, the facts. So this is a patient, um, perhaps Wolfgang, you can comment on this, which uh, has, who has uh, disproportionate mitral regurgitation, you, you all know these terms uh, introduced by Professor Grayburn. Uh, so um, if you look at the ratio between ERO area and uh, the left ventricular volume, then this patient is far in the, in the ballpark of, uh, of disproportionate mitral regurgitation. We know that, that the higher this ratio, the more likely uh, the patient will benefit from a prognostic aspect also, not only from a symptomatic aspect. So I have a small question before we're really discussing the echo of the patient. Um, did, did you have any fears, let's say, regarding the amyloidosis and the fragility of the tissues in this case? No, not, no, not really. Um, I mean, the, the, the point is well taken. And if you have very tethered leaflets, um, you should be probably a little bit more careful. But in this case, where basically the left ventricular architecture, the diameter of the left ventricle was, was well preserved. Uh, the volume was below 100 milliliter per square uh, meter uh, body surface area. So I wouldn't be so concerned. I, I didn't see so much uh, of tethering and tenting in this case, so um, I, I wouldn't be too concerned. But I think your, your point is very well taken. With respect to choosing the right device, one should be yeah. Um, considering uh, the basic disease here, yes. Oh. Okay. I mean, if we look at the, the course, it's very interesting, Stefan, the course of the patient, because you have a patient with, uh, from the beginning, not so severe MR, then you have a decompensation, you put him on medical treatment, 
um, you intensify it until you have reached the maximal dose, and then you still have severe mitral regurgitation. That, that exactly the, the pathway actually uh, that you follow during coapt, uh, you reproduce actually the condition of, of coapt. Um, and I would say, you know, the patient with amyloidosis with, uh, it was actually an exclusion criteria in coapt, so we are not exactly in that target population. But regarding the severity of mitral regurgitation, so we have a regurgitant orifice of 0.36, which is um, in the guideline actually a criteria of severity if the, the, this regurgitant orifice is elliptical. And finally, you look at the proportionality. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we can exchange on that. Um, the proportionality is, very, is a very interesting concept, but um, looking at all the studies that try to apply this factor on, on patient and on the population, it has never shown any prognostic effect. So, you know, it's not a predictor of mortality or a hard endpoint in our patient undergoing mitral clip. So it's a bit difficult to, uh, to have, um, you know, to, to, to judge about the meaning of this, of this uh, proportionality. Do you use it, Wolfgang or Nicole? Yeah, um, for sure we are using it all, I think. But uh, the important issue is, I think, that the, the naming is not very helpful for us because it just tells us that we have either um, severe mitral regurg um, um, and not um, so much heart failure or the other case around like mitral FR, they have, we have very advanced heart failure accompanied by the, a little bit of, of, of mitral regurg. And, 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 and coming back to that case, I think we are treating here the mitral valve and we are not treating the left ventricle because uh, cardiac amyloidosis in the left ventricle can't be treated with tear. And, 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 and if we consider that, and at least we are doing it in our center, um, and coming back to the patient's ventricular function, then we know what we have to do with, uh, with, uh, with mitral regurg. So. I mean, I, I agree. But on the other hand, it's, it's very educative for, for the staff. If you ask uh, um, the, the, the team, is this a patient you treat? Is this a patient with disproportionate MR or just proportionate? So they should reflect whom you are treating. As you, as you just said, Wolfgang, um, to, to make sure that, uh, that the patient selection is uh, equivalent and adequate. So let's see how the case went. Okay, perhaps we can do it um, in a way that um, we, we, we get off the, the sound. I'm not sure what you, what you like, and we can discuss. Uh, we switch gears and uh, go for the transeptal puncture. And we can talk here. So uh, I, I didn't do the introduction. So obviously, you see um, Professor Pfister here. He's running the program in Colombia of Zilke at the, um, at the um, bench here preparing the device. And um, we have our anesthesiologist who is not uh, not seeable. So what what we all do, obviously, what you what you know, is obviously looking for a right puncture site. So we had in this case a large atrium, uh, so height was not an issue. You can see here the slightly thickened septum and um, the passage of the sheath, which then is ex exchanged for for the mitral clip device. So these patients with amyloidosis have nice visibility. So this is a, an asset yeah, point. <laughs> to do the procedure. Yeah. So now you have the, the sheath in place. Just a technical question: you go with you go into the left uh, pulmonary vein. Uh, I do the same actually. But Wolfgang and Nicole, are you doing this, or do you you have a curve wire in the left atrium? I go to the vein also. Everybody goes to the vein? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Should be okay. safe. That's a, a safe uh, way to do Safety it. first. <laughs> I mean, so the question now arises which device to take in this case. I mean, as, as you can see here, uh, the leaflet length is uh, almost 11 millimeters. Um, we talked about tissue quality. Um, if not too much tethering, a bit of tethering there is for sure. Um, so what, what should we use? Um, I mean, as you all know, with the G4 devices family, we, we have basically four possibilities to choose from. Um, um, I'm not sure whether we want to discuss it or whether I should just 
no, that no, you know we, what we, I think we, we could, ended uh, up doing. So I could, I mean, we have, we have look, basically the factor you will need to decide on our first, maybe the Valveria, and you have shown it very nicely. So it's quite big. I mean, it's above four uh, square centimeters. So it's certainly a, a good Valveria for, for, for mitre clip. And the second is, I would look at the, the jet, and you mentioned also the tethering. So that's a typical situation where I would personally use an XTV, so the larger device with the longer arms. But I mean, there are probably other, other ideas as well. No, I agree that with the valve area of 5.5 uh, and with uh, the jet that we're seeing, we want to take a, a big device. So probably I would have one also for a XTV. Yeah. yeah, we used a wide, wide clip, but, but we, we, we were a little bit uh, anxious about uh, tissue and uh, the length of the posterior leaflet. And we thought, well, why don't go in with a, with a small device? NTV. NTW, yeah. exactly. And, uh, uh, and that's what you are seeing here. Yeah, I, yeah I, I also that we would also have considered this just for because of this amyloidosis. Maybe it's only a legend, but I mean we don't really know whether the, those leaflets are more fragile than a regular leaflet for other leaflets. So yeah, I understand. So Stefan, did you think about using one or, or two clip procedure? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Because we have this, this kind of intendation, or maybe it's even a cleft um, at yeah. the posterior leaflet. Right. So, so the idea was to take the first wide clip and see how, how far it goes. We, we um, tried to go as close as possible towards this indentation, but we did not want to go across it right in the commissures. This is something with a wide clip you, you probably don't want to do. Um, so as you can see here, we are maneuvering um, and we are changing uh, the trajectory of, of the clip, but then in the end aimed at um, placing this clip um, yeah, between P2 and P3 right laterally to this indentation. And uh, by doing so, we anticipated that just one clip is probably not enough. Um, but this is something you can decide thereafter. We, we, we were convinced that we have to um, to, to go a little bit asymmetric towards P3 in this case. So well, what, mm -hmm. Were you using uh, left atrial pressure for that procedure? Yeah, that's, a that's a nice and, and uh, new feature of G4 that you will be able to, to constantly <laughs> measure it. And I think this is, uh, this is very helpful. Um, in particular, in patients with, with degenerative MR, where you can nicely uh, see uh, sometimes dramatic drops in LA pressures. So. So we use this on a regular basis. And also, um, we can, we, you know that, that the grippers can be used independently. And we, we just checked for that. You may have seen it while we talked. Now, as you see, we already are in, in the ventricle. You, you, the beauty is that you still can readjust the orientation of the clip at this stage, um, if this changed a little bit. And then um, you can. Um, load your leaflets onto the clip. So it, it's very nice to look at, at all these steps. I mean, it's a very systematic view. You can see very nicely how you position the clip. And you don't hesitate in the room also to ask questions. If you have any question, we have a little bit of time uh, we can spend on this, um, on this live case. And if you have any question, uh, just uh, stand up and, and ask your question. So Stefan, do you always start with a simultaneous um, grip or, or do you start with independent grasping right away? That's a great question. Yeah, it's, I prefer to do it simultaneously, um, uh, but sometimes if, if you have very enlarged uh, anatomies, you, you are forced to do it uh, sequentially. Here you can nicely see um, LA pressure. It's, oh, it's difficult to see, uh, see on the screen there. Uh, which in, in this case, after placement of the first clip, dropped uh, by, by 10 uh, points, 10 millimeters of mercury. And you can see there's a little bit of residual MR left medially, mm -hmm. which we um, uh, accepted. Um, and on the other hand, you can nicely see that, that the one clip doesn't make uh, all the work. We, we then decided to say, OK, we leave it there and uh, implant a second one laterally to this one. 
So, Stefan, when you talk about left atrial pressure, you are looking at the V wave or at the mean pressure. How, how do you do you look at this? Uh, we, we would look at the V wave. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after all, we went for another clip, right? Exactly, yeah. we discussed it, yes. Um, but um, if you would reposition this one towards yeah. a central position, then you would, you would lose your acceptable result with respect to the medial uh, residual regurgitation. Absolutely. Yeah. If you, you could exchange it for a larger clip, but as I said, I, we were a little bit afraid of, of uh, tissue, potential tissue dam damage there. And, and here you can see that there's uh, enough uh, residual opening area yeah. of the valve for a second clip uh, into the lateral orifice. That's very nice. You know, that's very important that after the first grasp, you measure the 3D uh, mitral valve area to be sure that you can implant a second one. And not only rely on gradient, you know, because in that kind of patient with reduced uh, cardiac output, maybe you know, the anesthesiology uh, condition, uh, low heart uh, rate, you can underestimate that situation. So I think it very nicely demonstrated. You measure on 3D the remaining uh, valve area, the two orifices, and then you decide on your strategy. But I mean, that's, that's, an excellent strat that's an excellent situation now because you have one clip, you have the possibility to have a second one, which is probably something you should think about before entering the procedure re re relating to the mitral valve area. And you don't have any jet on the medial part of, of the, the clip you just implanted. So you just need to address the second jet on the lateral part and, and, and you, will be, you will be fine. Huh? That's what you are doing now. I think it's, it, it's also an important point. You started very smart, um, going very much to the, to the um, medial side and, and ending with no regurg, um, significant regurg at, at, at that point instead of starting very centrally, yeah. usually then you, you will end up with a three-clip procedure if you want to have a perfect result. So like and it's, this approach. It's, easier, it's easier to implant the second one more laterally. You see now it's quite easy. It's uh, almost only fluoroscopy based. So, you know, to, to have the first clip implanted medially is, uh, is, a, very, is a very wise way. You're to very nice to me. All, all, this is very, very pleasant to <laughs> hear <laughs> all these comments. Yeah. No, but we seem to be using the same techniques, so... <laughs> Okay, so this mm -hmm. is the question is what is this? We, we then ended up using a, a small device here. So it's an, an anti... So do you often mix up the uh, devices? Do you happen to have an XT, then an NT, or try to avoid mixing different sizes? No, I think, well, I think this is the beauty of a sequential therapy so that you can adjust and, and in a way mix these uh, as you need. And, uh, and, and here, uh, we know that in, in atrial mitral regurgitation, orifice areas are not so overwhelmingly large in the end, so, so that's why you would probably be a little bit more conservative with respect to the width of the second uh, device. And um, yeah, you can, you can nicely see it looks a little bit different than the first one. And obviously, you, you now aim to get it as, as close as possible to the first device. So, Stefan, do you think it's easier um, with the um, um, with the not wide clip, so the the regular one, to bring them next to each other? Um, this is at least our experience. Yeah. So this is why I was asking for a two clip procedure. Then we usually start not with a wide one, yeah. but we use a smaller one, and and, and then um, we, we we try to avoid the gap yeah. between the two clips. Yeah, it, it, the, the, the risk of entanglement is, is lower with the smaller one. And if you are forced uh, to your position, given the first clip in, being in place, um, then, uh, then this, is, uh, this is, I think, helpful. Yeah. So you, the, the reason why you shoot the smaller one was to minimize the impact on mitral valve area. That was your, exactly. your sort. Yeah, this was yeah, the driving decision, yeah. So it's always easier to ask those questions after the procedure is done. But you think that if you could uh, took an XTW, we could have made it with only one clip. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, yeah, I, I, I can't but with answer the risk, this. With <laughs> the risk, of course, of the leaflet, leaflet tethering. But it's it's possible for sure. It's possible. Um, uh, but I would I would do it again like this. Uh, it's only because you said you are, that we are too nice, so I'm yeah. trying to... <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. 
So you know, that's actually some... the, the beauty of this kind of procedure because, you, you know, at the end you could uh, redo yeah. the scenario and you yeah. don't know, uh, you, you, you never know. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. But, I, you know, at, at the end, the strategy bringing you the less MR is the best one. And if you have a good result, it, it, it was the right one. So there's a technical question online. How accurate is calculating the valve opening area in 3D? Just um, this is also a nice question, Stefan. You're very nice today, T. Yeah, it it dep obviously it depends on a, on a uh, echo quality in the in the individual patient, and um, it's probably not entirely precise. But I think in this case you can be very confident that you can uh, find the circumference and and the measurement should be okay for guiding your decision of, mm -hmm. of a second clip. And do you still measure, measure the gradient? And if you do, at what level do you stop? How much gradient do you accept for your patients? Oh, yeah. Oh, you for sure don't want to have a gradient above five millimeters of mercury. Oh, you're, you're at five. Do you do the same? Do you stop at five? Um, we, we accept sometimes six, I have to say, but we, as I said, we really rely on 3D mitral valve area. So gradient is not so important for us. If we are above 1.5 square centimeter, we accept it. Um, if not, we, we are very uh, conservative, even if the gradient is low. I think we, we have now the data that seven doesn't make a difference to five or to three regarding prognostics and clinical incidences. So I think we can be more aggressive in, in, in certain patients and just uh, um, focus on a very good um, MR result. Yes, I guess the worst is to really let the patient live with both a mitral regurgitation and a mitral stenosis. So if you have some, some, some gradient with a, with a regurgitation, maybe it's the worst uh, type. So either you clean the regurgitation or you keep it without a gradient but with a residual MR. This is practically what we are doing. So thank you for this very nice case. Very well done. So let's stay with you. Congratulations. So now we're going to take a look at this case uh, on the light of the new data from Xpand. How do you think? How did the case, case compare with Xpand? I think we just nicely discussed it. Um, so it's, it's for sure a functional MR patient, and I brought you the data. Um, and, and the data is focusing on co-opt criteria. But I think what's, what's not fitting into expand is that atrial, atrial MR is included into the registry because this is a very new um, um, disease entity and we have to be careful then, then, then to draw too many conclusions on, on that type of, of mitral regurg in regard to, to, to the data um, already published. So, so I would be kind of cautious, but we have disproportionate MR and it's more a functional type of MR. So we would expect a very good um, result. So can you tell us more about these expand data? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I brought some more slides, and I think this is putting the challenge on to Stefan's case. So what do we expect if we treat functional MR and we see in 90% of the patients an, an excellent MR result even one year after the procedure? So it's less than MR 1 plus or, or even zero in 90% of the patients. And when you bring that to the different um, disease etiologies, and this is something different, then you see why we have a 2A um, 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 recommendation for functional MR, because functional MR is treated much easier with tear uh, therapy than um, 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 degenerative disease, and you see that um, uh, regarding the results of remaining MR. And, 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 and Nicole just asked me if I have data with me. I don't have it, but we know that the residual result um, um, regarding MR is very relevant for the prognosis. And, and when, you, when we refer to COAPT, um, we see that patients that, uh, that, that end the procedure with um, severe MR have the same prognosis as being treated just conservatively. So we have to be very cautious about um, 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 achieving very good results. Very good. And now we are beyond the expand, we have the expand Gen 4 data also. Yeah. So to, just to make it clear to everybody, band um, G4 is, is including now four different um, um, clips, um, um, the wider ones with the, with the large or the smaller arms. And it has um, the left atrial uh, pressure control mode. And, and, and Stefan just explained nicely in his case that we are using it to get an 
impression how much we reduced um, um, mitral regurg in these cases. And we have this controlled gripper actuation. And the expand G4 is basically addressing in this registry, um, which is um, called up echo controlled, um, what is the impact of these new technical features. And I think this is um, something interesting is so with the new clips, more procedures in comparison to expand end up with one clip. And it's smart to have one clip. And in most of the cases, and this might be triggered to the innovation, wider clips were used. So uh, most of the patients had a wide clip used, so it might be smarter and in the future to go with a wider clip um, in most of the cases. And regarding um, the uh, controlled grip actuation, I think this is also interesting. It's another feature, but it is primarily used only in about 70 to 80 percent of the patients. It's not um, um, more than that, where um, um, the independent grasping is used as a first approach. But as a second approach, um, it's used in 70% of the patients. So um, um, the, uh, the, 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 the implanter tries to optimize the result of leaflet insertion, tries to maybe reorient its clip a little bit further and achieving a better result. And I think this can already be seen in the expand G4 study. When you look at procedural success, the new features of the clip give us a higher success rate of now 97.4%. Uh, and the device time, since um, many patients got only one clip implanted, although the results are very excellent, I will show them to you, is now down to 30, the device time to 34 minutes. So in half an hour, a procedure like that can be um, um, easily accomplished with a very um, um, robust and long-term good result. And maybe this might um, be addressed by independent leaflet grasping. So um, leaflet detachment or single leaflet um, um, attachment rates also dropped from 2% to 1% now in, 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 in the uh, G4 expand registry. So the technical new features are not just toys, but they make the procedures much safer and much more controlled. Very interesting, thank you. Uh, Stefan, do you want to comment on these data? I mean, this is, I mean the data are, are really impressive, right? I mean, if you see uh, uh, the mortality rates, if you see leaflet, single leaflet uh, detachment, um, I mean, obviously these, these are registries, uh, obviously uh, the, the, the sites are well experienced who were participating, but it shows how the the technology went. I think this is uh, great to see. Yeah, definitely. So, do you think this is going to widen the indications, or are we going to go to even more severe cases or more difficult cases? Let's say. Fabian. You know, I think so. You know, the, the data shows clearly over the year that we can improve result with uh, with a different generation. It's difficult to say is that only technical improvement. Of course, this play a role, but there is also the experience. I would say not only of the operator but of the center um, as a whole uh, structure, and also of the of the imaging that that improve um, a lot the the result of this therapy uh, over the year. But we still we still have patients. Stefan, I think you would agree, and Wolfgang, uh, we still have patients where we cannot achieve perfect results. Uh, some very um, difficult generative patient, and and uh, Stefan, you have for example a replacement uh, option also at your center. Is that uh, is there a room for for this patient? How do you do you handle this? Um, you look at the anatomy. How, how do this articulate in your center the interaction between edge to edge and replacement? Yeah, I think this is, a, is a very important. It's a great question. I'm uh, implanting a, a transapical device um, needs a patient who is capable of, of getting through this uh, intervention. So, so for this, you do not only have to look at the anatomy, but also at the in, entire patient to select uh, between these two, um, the mortality rates between tenor implantation and the clip uh, procedure obviously is, is, is it's a quite high delta still, so we have to, to look there. But, but I think on the other hand, we should not refrain from using uh, a, a valve if uh, the anatomy is simply not good enough for a clip. If you have calcification, if you have severely degenerated, degenerated valves, 
uh, where you can put a clip in, but, but the, the functional result will not be adequate, I think then you should be critical about doing this. So your, your approach is first to assess the feasibility of a tier, and then if it's not f really a good case, then you will switch to, uh, to a replacement? Yes, yes. I mean, you, simply, you have to talk to the patient. If you have a mortality of 1 to 2 percent for a clip procedure and you have a mortality of, I don't know, 8, eight to 10, perhaps even higher, um, uh, for a 10 line procedure, is something you have to bear in mind uh, talking to a patient, yes. But if you had the possibility to do the same cases transeptally, what would, how would you choose between the two? And there's a question also for you. If you had the possibility to have transeptal uh, procedure and, uh, and it's a replacement, how, did, how would you choose the base? How would you identify? Well, I think what we then need is uh, signs of non-inferiority. Um, and if we have this, I think then we are in a very luxurious position. And then we can really say, um, if this is comparable with respect to risk, uh, what is the anatomy uh, driving the best result? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, but, but I think the discussion is very important because usually we categorize in functional and, and primary MR, and what we are discussing here are, are patients with functional MR that also have primary disease, so they have degenerative disease, and, and, and to be honest, most of the patients we see have a mixed disease type. So in, in, in this regard, I think it's very important um, to start that discussion. And uh, the replacement devices are very innovative, and we don't have the data yet. But I think we should be smart enough to select for these studies exactly the patients we know in advance that they will not end up with a sufficient um, 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 tear result. And I think this is something important. And we have all the options because we have in enough experience um, to 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 anticipate how the tear procedure will end, how many clips we will need, and how uh, the result will look. So I, I would also recommend then uh, um, to look at these patients differently and, and, and try to include them in transeptal studies. There is, there is a question, uh, Wolfgang and Stefan, from the audience as well regarding imaging. You know, we are alluding a little bit to that because um, we emphasize how important it is to, uh, to look at the, at the exact anatomy of the patient, uh, also in that discussion between mitral clip and replacement. How did you improve over the year? You know, we talk about technical improvement of the device, but how did you improve or facilitate improvement of imaging capacities at your center? Is that education? Is that, uh, is that, how do you do that? Yeah, certainly. So it, uh, first, it's technology. When we started, I think everybody knows how 3D TEE looked. It was horrible. And, and we put people there that didn't want to be in the cath lab. So this is how we started it, at least in Germany. Um, because it's not very pleasant um, to be the imager while the interventionalist um, is not very patient and wants to go ahead and doesn't see the right structures. So I, I think this has everybody to keep in mind. But this changed over the last 10 years. So And, and um, in our institution, I think this is true for most of the cases, we, we have a career for a cardiac interventional imager, but we also have a career for a, a, a tear person. And the tear person goes through the imaging career, and then he goes on the table and, and puts in the clips. And, I, uh, and, and, and in this regard, I think it's very helpful because then the patient, uh, the, 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 the doctor on the table, can control the imager if he's not experienced enough um, um, to drive the procedure. And, 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 and in this regard, young people are very, I think, motivated um, to go through that um, type of, of, of education. How about uh, the breath holding? This is a question also from the audience. Breath holding either for grasping, but also the volumes uh, when you need to get better images or better co-optation. Do you use those items? Yeah, uh, we just call it breath hold. We keep it very simple, um, um, but we do every grasp on, on the mitral leaflet on, on the breath hold, and it just gives you stability regarding um, lateral and, 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 and medial movement. And, and so you can have a breath hold for 10 minutes. It doesn't care. The patient usually doesn't care about it. And, and, and you have very precise um, 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 then grasping of the leaflets and very precise orientation of the clip. So we are using that uh, basically standardized. Stefan, you wanted to react on imaging as well? 
No, I just wanted to reinforce what, what, what Wolfgang uh, said with respect to the appreciation you have to build in your institution with respect to the task and the role of the imager. I think, as, as you just said, if, if the imager is just an echo person who's not given a chance to, to, to get a visible position inside the department, then, then we are doing something wrong. I mean, these, these persons who are guiding us are, are as important as uh, the, the interventionalists at the table. So we have to, to emphasize the importance of these in order to make this attractive for, for, for young cardiologists to go this track. So this is exactly as, as, as Wolfgang pointed out. I guess we also need to include in the team the anesthesiologist because at some point, if you have a good anesthesiologist who understood the procedure and what we, what we want, he will understand why we are asking for a brass hold or for reducing the volumes or whatever. So I guess this is even more important for tricuspid because it does really respond to changes in uh, type of anesthesia. But I don't know if you have your dedicated anesthesia team for tier or not really. Not, not really, actually, but the, 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 I agree. You know, I agree. It's um, everybody needs to be involved, and and e everybody is important for the result of the procedure. And I think that's a key for the imager as well to understand that he's actually one of the operator. He's, he's also responsible for the result, as are the interventional cardiologists. And uh, there is sometimes a bit of a process to, they are, the, the images are not just showing images, they are actually taking decisions with you and deciding on the selection of the device, maybe or even deciding on the selection of the patient uh, when, it, when it comes to the table. So it's, um, it's absolutely key in the development of the program. But I think the point regarding the anesthesiologist is a very important one. So it, it, it has to be a team that, 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 that's working on the same patient and, and then you can, can um, achieve um, procedure times of 30 minutes because everything is then standardized and everybody knows um, where the anesthesiologist is important and where, where it's not needed to, to be around. So we have another interesting question, question from the audience related to fusion image, imaging. Do you have, is anybody using fusion for tear procedures? Actually, yes, we, we started with this uh, fusion imaging between echo and, uh, and fluoroscopy uh, with the echo navigator. And I have to say it's quite useful for the, for the, for the transeptal puncture. You can orientate yourself quite well. You can localize some landmarks like LAA or the pulmonary vein. You can localize the septum. So it's a, for me, it's a quite useful technology, and um, actually we are, we are using it. What about you, Stefan? We're not routinely using it, but I would ap uh, appreciate what you say. And, and if if uh, um, uh, technology is improving further so that uh, uh, the exactness of what we are seeing is, is getting even better, I, I, I think this is probably what we will have uh, in the future as a routine. Do you agree? Is it a luxury or is it a must? I think for mitral, at least in, in my regard, it's, it's luxury. Um, um, for TR, it's, it, it will be a must. And, and for TAVR procedure, a complex structural disease, I think we will get used to it because it's part of our pre-planning the procedure. And in the end, I think in five years, if you ask me the same question, I will say for MR, it's also then a must because it will be standardized and it helps us to understand what we are doing there and being even more precise. And we also have to include, I guess, ICE at some point in this discussion. So how would you position all of this? Yeah, I think this would, would, would um, help us to, to, to overcome um, then, then and general anesthesia in these patients. And then we do this once in a while in critical ill patients and, and just go with um, um, sedation in these patients. It, it works. And, and ICE would be another option to be less invasive in these very um, fragile patients and, and, and achieve um, exact imaging. But I think there will be uh, some way to go um, to get the same quality as we have now in 3D TEE. And I think this made the procedure so successful because we have complete control over, over the valve and then the whole patient. Is there, is there maybe any question from the room? Nobody? Everything clear? You can also criticize, huh? <laughs> yes, one question. There is a microphone there, you can jump to it. Oh, be careful. Yes.
sorry, just a detail, but for your second clip, uh, in your case, um, your device was very parallel to the outer axis. Uh, was it on purpose or, or not? Well, the the, uh, the purpose obviously is to to um, to have the same alignment as for the first clip, so you wouldn't wouldn't change too much from your uh, previous um, orientation of your sheath, um, and then in this in our case go just directly lateral to it, and 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 this fine adjustment then is done with with the clip being in the left atrium. Um, uh, and and yeah, in parallel to uh, to the first one. So um, so that's the, the the main purpose. How you achieve it? Um, I, I wasn't aware of a, a very specific or unusual uh, way of of steering uh, a guide and and the system. No. And everything is with the second clip. Everything is m m much more easier. So you you look on fluoroscopy. I mean that's what you did. Actually, you oriented your clip on fluoroscopy. You turn the clip um, next to the to the previous one, and then the grasping is also uh, a bit easier. So you know, I agree. If you have some angulation issue, uh, sometimes it's it's a bit easier to grasp uh, the second with the second clip than with the, with the first one. And maybe one more point. Yeah, it's working again. Um, we are using constantly for the second clip the sheath. So to, to just move laterally or, or medial, we just uh, push or, or, or pull then on the sheath. So start laterally and bring it then on a more medially um, to, to, to the clip and do that only with the sheath and not with the knobs any longer to, to be um, in the same alignment as, as, as for the first clip. Okay, thank you everyone. So thank you for attending today. We are at the end of this session. Very rich session and I guess we've seen that uh, basically if we want to summarize, uh, tear indications are really getting broader and broader. So now we have the severe SMR that apply to go up but also those of our SMR. We also have the asymptomatic patients. We also have uh, more data for the safety of these procedures, and I guess the future is for more and more of these procedures. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for the audience, and thank you also Fabien, Stefan, and Wofang. Have a nice day. Thank you.